Sterrenkunde is van kind af aan mijn passie. Sinds my mijn naam is Romke Schieving. I have a passion for astronomy. I am Romke Schieving. Because of this passion, there is an old telescope in my living room. Simply because it is a great decoration. It did not need to be a functional telescope even, but it should be an old one. The outcome is far more surprising than I expected. It became a quest, traveling to the beginning of astrophotography at the end of the 19th century, and even to a monastery in Germany where Josef Fraunhofer developed his Fraunhofer telescope. For some time I had been searching the net for an old telescope. But many antique telescopes were very expensive, or they were fake antique. December 2012, I found my telescope in internet. It was for sale in Cologne, Germany. In the description I found only mentioned the size of the telescope, but nothing about the lenses. I saw it had three telescopes in one. An extraordinary combination. The tube of the big telescope, in comparison to the diameter of the lens, seemed very short. Normally, one would expect a tube of five feet length for that lens. The big telescope also had a sliding tube, on which, in an unusual way, was attached a focusing device. The second telescope had a strange focusing device that puzzled me. I wondered if it belonged to that big telescope. The third, very elegant, indicative telescope made me seriously consider the offer. I visited with a salesman and my first impression was a piece of scrap copper. The heavy copper tube of the big telescope was hidden under a heavy dirt layer and was heavily oxidated. The mounting was missing. After checking the objectives, I found that they were missing for the smaller telescope and for the indicative telescope. I wanted to check it with the big telescope as well, but found that I could not loosen the heavy brass cap. I then looked through the tube with a laser light and was surprised to find the lens still in the big tube. Further, there was one original eyepiece of the big telescope and an eyepiece for the indicative telescope. After some negotiation, I bought the telescope, still doubting I had made a good buy. Considering the work that was apparently going to be connected with that telescope. Back at home, I tried to get off the cap. First, I soaked the cap and the part in it in warm, soapy water for hours. After that, I sprayed a little bit of penetrating oil on it. Then I started with a broad metal chisel and a hammer, giving tiny taps at the rim of the cap. I finally got the cap loosened enough and was able to take it off the lens. And found in elegant letters on it, big G, small U, big S, Mertz, München. I found a telescope of one of the most distinguished telescope builders of the 19th century. Right at this moment, my big quest for the history of this special telescope combination started. The name Mertz is related to one of the most important scientists and optic masters of the 19th century, Joseph von Fraunhofer. At the age of 11 years old, both his parents had died, and the young orphan had to work for his living in an optic workshop. He was exploited there and was not allowed to attend school. It all changed when the workshop where Joseph worked collapsed. 
Prince Maximilian IV of Bavaria was in Munich at that time, and this prince was so moved by the fate of the young von Frauenhofer that he decided to support him financially. The young Fraunhofer, 14 at the time, bought a grinding machine and started making optical instruments. He learned from books and became a specialist in the field of optics. Joseph von Utschneider noticed the qualities of the young Fraunhofer. Utschneider was a successful businessman, selling among other things optical instruments. After the secularization, Utschneider had bought a former convent in Benedict Boyan in Bavaria, where he had started an optical factory. In this convent, there were so-called glashütten, ovens for the production of glass. The glass oven that was used for optical glass was mostly still in its original state. At the beginning of the 19th century, optical master Pierre-Louis Guinan was working here. Soon after Fraunhofer entered the scene, a conflict arose between Master Guinan and the new employee. Guinan was not able to create 100% clear glass, which is of utmost importance for telescope lenses. Finally, Utschneider gave Fraunhofer the job, who within a couple of years improved the production and the quality of optical glass. This from a scientific approach rather than a trial and error approach. After a couple of years, the telescopes made by Utschneider and Fraunhofer were among the best telescopes in the world. Nowadays, the name Fraunhofer is used to indicate the lens system of a telescope. With this new generation of telescopes, one could reach enlargements of 300 times till 700 times. Thus, Fraunhofer had brought the stars closer to us. Fraunhofer developed for this professional type of telescopes a new kind of mounting with a follow mechanism. This kind of mounting would later on be named a German mounting and is still being used today. The follow mechanism could eliminate the turning of the earth and therefore the movement of the stars in the sky. With a never before seen precision, astronomers could now solely concentrate on observing. With telescopes made by Fraunhofer, great discoveries were made, like this telescope in the German Museum in Munich, with which the planet Neptune was discovered in 1846. Fraunhofer's biggest discovery probably was the Fraunhofer lines that can be seen when sunlight breaks through a prism. These lines were discovered earlier already, but with the help of this specially developed spectrograph, Fraunhofer discovered up to 700 lines in the sunlight. Nowadays, a spectrograph is indispensable for modern astronomy. Fraunhofer died young, and his pupil, Georg Mertz, took over. Georg Mertz was an engineer, but not a scientist. The technical inheritance of Fraunhofer gave the company an enormous advantage, and its optical devices were being sold all over the world. In spite of producing high-quality instruments, the company stayed too traditional. At the end of the 19th century, firms like Zeiss and other great brands took over their leading position. The Mertz company was active till the outbreak of World War II. Then the company bankrupted and was sold in small parts to small firms. With my small lath, and milling machine, 
I started to make the missing parts. It took a lot of time, but it was time well spent. The next problem had arrived. The lens fitting could not be opened. Here too, someone had been busy trying to get the lens out by hitting a piece of the lens fitting in order to hit the rim to open it, which that person had not succeeded in. Since I was not able to get the lens fitting loose, I decided to take another notch out of the rim opposite of the first notch. With a metal stave, I then little by little could screw the lid of the fitting loose. When I finally could get the lens out of its fitting, I discovered the biggest surprise. A so-called triplet. A triplet telescope of the 19th century is very rare for this time, because they were difficult to make and very costly. First, I started putting each part in the right position together to get an idea about this telescope. It became clear that a small telescope had been attached at the side of the big tube. Traces of its attachment were easily found like holes for a missing socket. Soon it became clear that the gun side had not been part of the original telescope. This had been part of a World War II anti-aircraft gun. This telescope had been used for astrophotography. That's why there is a guide scope, the sliding tube and the indicative telescope. We expect that the crosshair was illuminated, illuminated probably by a small oil lamp. This telescope is a unique example built in assignment for someone, and unfortunately there are no designs or photographs available anymore. The wooden camera has disappeared, but in Denmark, at the Urania Observatory, we found a big 19th century Zeiss telescope. Next to the main telescope is a 15 cm Mertz telescope with an original camera. I used the telescope of the Urania Observatory as example for my reconstruction. In internet, I found a cheap 19th century daguerreotype camera. This camera had a brass focuser. I could use both parts. The small telescope got the brass focuser matching the time. Both parts had to be modified. I had to make the wooden wall smaller. For the mounting, I still had an old Ganymede's mounting and I made a tripod from a boat mast and found it to be a very steady base for the almost 44 pounds heavy telescope. To get an idea of the picture quality, I first try to film an object in the distance. In this case, a tree. The image was rather sharp, with little color mistakes. Here we see a picture of the moon. The sun. And the Orion Nebula, made with a modern camera with chip size 3.5 cm times 2.5 cm. The original glass pane camera has an image size of 6 cm x 9 cm. With that camera, a large part of the sky could be captured, making the camera adequate for viewing or photographing nebulas or comets. All the characteristics of later telescopes for astrophotography till the beginning of the 21st century are found in this exemplar, like the finderscope, 
and the guide scope with the illuminated crosshair. This telescope had almost gone lost, but has been returned to its present beauty. Now it can again be used even for digital photography, as these photographs prove. Und die äh, Fettschicht sorgt dafür, dass das nicht ganz deckt. 